Hi. This is the governor. You can hi, say hi. Hi, 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 hi. It's good to be home. Actually, you know, I used to spend a lot of time in this building. Yeah, this right. used to be York Federal Savings and Loan. So never mind. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to welcome. You always talk about going to, and they laugh at you. The bank. No, 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 that was a bank that actually loans money to. I'm going to talk about them here. <laughs> loans money to my company. No, this is a this is a, a traditional savings and loan building society. Were you on the board? I was chairman of the holding company, and I was on the board and the executive committee. And we would meet every Friday and talk about what go over loans. And we've since moved city government. To talk, yeah. Just move the mic over to you. Or okay. Okay. I think the mayor goes first. We since moved city government here. Every one, all offices are here, one stop shop. And when a governor worked in downtown York, he was a supporter of that move of ours as well, too. But we want to welcome everyone here to City Hall. Thank you for your flexibility in moving around. It's a beautiful day in downtown York, especially when I'm provided with the opportunity to introduce my friend and our esteemed governor, Governor Tom Wolf. We know the governor. Um, to be a dedicated, passionate, and focused leader who is vested and committed to having healthy educational systems and financially sound communities throughout uh, Pennsylvania. We also know he understands the meaning of hard work, the importance of innovation, the value of community investment, and that education is the cornerstone of, of any of the progress we want to see in our community. So it provides me with great pleasure to welcome to our city hall Pennsylvania's 47th governor and York's very own Governor Tom Wolf. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, as I said, it's really nice to be home. Um, the mayor and I go back a long way. Of course, she's mayor of the city of York now. But but uh, when you first came back to York, you were executive director of the South George Street Community Partnership. I was on the board of that. It was a neighborhood association right. that I think has did a lot to revolutionize to to really promote and, and forward all the, the great things that you continue to do as mayor, but uh, the South George Street area of York uh, is uh, really a beautiful place. I don't think people remember, I'm an old person, but, but this used to be a one-way street going south, and at Jackson Street there was a big bunker, basically, mm -hmm. with a huge sign that, that said, you know, one way, you have to take a right, but it basically said, you're not really welcome here in York. And it, and and the city took that down, turned George Street into a two-way street. Uh, and I think uh, uh, South George Street, uh, that whole Boundary Avenue project, uh, revolutionized the south entrance into to York. Uh, and and uh, you were you were contributing even back then. So it's good to be back, and it's good to, that to, you know to have you as mayor. I, I'm here because I want to talk about my budget. Uh, obviously, the budget was due on June 30th. This is now. August 12th, uh, so we're late. And and the, the reason for that is simple. Um, we could have, I think we had a choice between an on-time budget that really didn't do anything for Pennsylvania, uh, it was the same old, same old, a lot of smoke and mirrors, or we could do something that actually moved Pennsylvania forward. Uh, I'm a first-term governor. Uh, it's the first time I've ever run for public office. Um, and I did it because as a native Pennsylvania, I was born here, actually just north of here, uh, because I, I think Pennsylvania deserves better than the smoke and mirrors and the same old games that we've been playing up in Harrisburg for generations. Uh, and I want to change that. Uh, and you don't change things evidently by going and saying, hey, I, hey folks, I, I have a great idea. Why don't we actually be more transparent? Why don't we open things up here and, and actually tell the truth? Uh, instead of having a smoke and mirrors budget, let's have a budget that actually balances in reality. Um, and that's not the way the game has been played, as I've been reminded a number of times. So I'm basically going public with my uh, with my story and saying, you know, we at Pennsylvanians, 12.7 million Pennsylvanians, have a decision to make. We can keep doing what we've been doing or we can do things differently. Uh, and I'm for making things different. I, I think we ought to be doing things the right way uh, and not the way we've been doing them, uh, because the way we've been doing them has led to a lot of bad things. Uh, it's led to credit downgrades. It's led to uh, uh, the kind of shenanigans that, that really haven't taken Pennsylvania forward. Uh, it's led to, to places where our schools are being underfunded uh, and uh, property taxes are going through the roof. So I am, am here to basically make my appeal straight to the public, saying, you know, I think 
you want me to represent you, not the rules as they were. And uh, if I'm wrong, of course, I'll be a one-term governor, and, and that's the way it's going to be. But that's the way a democracy works. So I think we have a choice, and I want us to, to make the, the right choice here. So let me, let me just give you some of the, the, the stuff that, that I've been seeing while I've been in Harrisburg. And let me, start, let me start and finish with the budget. On June 30th, I was presented with a so-called budget. Here's what it had. It doesn't work. Mathematically, it doesn't work. It had a lot of one-time uh, gimmicks. And I keep saying, uh, and Jan, I, you know, this is not the bank that actually lent me the money for my business. That's the other way. That's a commercial bank. This was a savings and loan that did residential mortgages. But that banker would have thrown me out of his office had I gone to him with the budget I received. And here's why. It doesn't add up. There is over a billion dollars of gimmicks in it. For example, they started with an assumption that... Next year's revenues, we're going to be, and that's what you do in budgeting. If you've budgeted, you know, your sales folks will come in and say, oh, we're going to just have sales go through the roof next year. Oh, how are you going to do that? Well, it makes the balance budget, uh, or the budget balance, but it doesn't actually uh, adhere to reality. And so they put $100 million extra revenue into the budget. $100 million over and above what the independent, I focus on the word independent, fiscal office said next year's revenues were going to be. $100 million start where your, your revenues are going to be higher. Then, then it goes to expenses. Uh, the um, uh, first thing they did was take uh, 27, I'm sorry, $87 million of Social Security payments that the state reimburses so, uh, school districts for. Uh, it actually does it in advance. This year they decided we're going to do it after the fact. We'll do it as a reimbursement. That means we'll pay a year late. Now, that's called stretching the trade when you're in business. That means you pay your bills late. And businesses go through times when they're tight and you pay your bills a little bit late. But let's not mistake that is you're paying your bills late. And there's a reason why companies want you to pay your bills on time, and that is because they need the money. So when you pay your bills late, someone gets hurt. In this case, the school districts. $27.9 million that were cut in the prior administration uh, on, uh, for county services, uh, that $27.9 million cut was continued in this budget. $300 million uh, were basically simply ignoring uh, what are called the spring updates, and that's where the budget, comes, budget office comes and says, okay, we're now in May or June of the 2014-15 fiscal year, and we made projections back in 2014 as to where we would end up. Here's where we're actually ending up. We're spending this amount of money. Revenues are actually at this. And you net all those things out. There's some things that came in higher, some things that came in lower. The net was about $300 million uh, uh, off from what the Republicans put in their budget. That's $300 million. They just assume, no, we're not going to accept that that's the way things actually ended up. Uh, there's $187 million for uh, things like uh, 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 human services uh, that are mandated by the feds and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the stuff that was mandated by the, the, the feds that we have to do. They're just saying we're not going to do that. Now, you can argue about that, and maybe there's some money you can squeeze out of that, but it's $187 million. They just blithely assumed we're not going to have to pay. Uh, so if you do those things, uh, and then there's one final thing, and this is for, for, I know there's some youth and services folks here in the county, uh, $172 million in child welfare pa payments that, that go to counties like your county. I was in Montgomery County yesterday, $172 million. Um, they're going to pay that late. And, uh, you know, again, they're going to stretch the trade. They're going to pay that stuff late. So the counties that are already stressed when it comes to human service to child welfare payments, uh, you're going to be stretched even more if you if you go by this. Now, these I just say all these things because I could have signed that budget, and I, I would have been lauded by some as saying, "Geez, you know, we have an on-time budget, and and you know, you, you you played by the the old-fashioned rules, and and you went along with the sort of wink and the nod that these one-time gimmicks are actually the, the way things are actually done in Harrisburg." And I said, "I don't, I don't think so. I mean, maybe I'm being naive, maybe I'm being an amateur, but." Uh, that's not the way the real world works. And I don't care what you say in Harrisburg, but that's just not the way it, it's supposed to work. And actually, last year, the majority leader of the Senate, Jay Corman, he wasn't majority leader then, he is now, 
said, you know, we really got to look out more than one year when we do budgeting. So we don't do stuff that, that is just good for one year, but not for the next year. We actually are probably going to be looking at a broad-based tax increase next year to try to make ends meet because we've sort of run out of, of uh, the smoke and mirrors. He didn't say smoke and mirrors, but the, the gimmicks. Uh, but that's what he said. So what has this meant for us? Uh, why am I so adamant that we shouldn't keep doing the smoke and mirrors? It does feel good because, you know, over here they're saying, look up here, no personal income tax increase, no sales tax increase. Meanwhile, back here, they're hiding all this other stuff that they don't want you to see. One of the things they don't want you to see is the huge increase in property taxes. Uh, you talk to people in your county uh, who are even nonpartisan, and, and you say, hey, you know, your personal income tax didn't go up last year, your sales tax didn't go up last year. And they say, yeah, but my, but my, my property tax went through the roof. In fact, I'm, I'm going to be leaving, leaving the, uh, you okay? All right. Sorry. Okay, so, so the property taxes have gone through the roof and people are, are going to be losing their homes as a result of that. That's what you get from a budget that doesn't balance. You actually do get tax increases and, it, and it's not right. Second thing is that we're, we're actually paying more for our, we're paying more uh, in, uh, for debt uh, service right now than we would if we actually had our financial house in order. Again, you could say I'm a partisan here, and I'm, I'm actually saying something that, that has a, a, a partisan message. So maybe you shouldn't believe me. Maybe I'm not the most objective person in the world. I, that, I'll grant you that. I'm not. I have, a, I have a dog in this hunt. But how about the outside rating agencies that have downgraded our debt five times in the last four years? How about those outside objective rating agencies that have downgraded our debt three times just in the last year? That's Fitch, S&P, uh, Moody's. Uh, they actually have done that. So you still say, well, so what? That doesn't really mean anything. I mean, those are Wall Street folks, and that's sort of an esoteric thing. Well, how does that really affect me? Well, here's how it affects you. I asked our, um, our budget secretary, what, what exactly are we paying in, in a premium uh, when we borrow money? You know how when you go to the bank, when you came to York Federal and you borrowed money, if your credit score wasn't so hot, you paid a higher interest rate. I know that comes as a surprise too. If your FICO score is low, you pay a higher. Well, so does the Commonwealth. And our credit score is not very good. So we're paying more. So how much are we paying? We're paying 83 basis points more. That's 8.3 tenths of 1%. So you say, what's 8.3 tenths of 1% extra that we're paying? We can afford that. Well, right now, Pennsylvania has about $17 billion of debt. Take 17 billion times that extra 8.3 tenths of 1%. You know how much that is every year we're paying in extra interest? $139 million. Now, there is some old debt that was, you know, back when we were in good shape, uh, and that hasn't rolled off yet, but new debt is 83 basis points. If we keep doing this, uh, the, the, the bond houses have told us that if we go out and borrow some more money, it'll be at about 100 basis point premium. So let's just say 83 basis points. That's $139 million a year we're paying. It's not going to schools. It's not going to roads and bridges. It's not going to economic development. It's not going to tax reduction. It's going to people who are lending us money, and we're paying that extra amount because we don't want to put our financial house in order. So over here, we're saying no taxes. Over here, we're saying every year, $139 million more is mounting up that somebody's going to pay for our kids, our grandchildren, us. So it's just not honest. I want to change that. And I want a budget that balances. I want a budget that actually invests in education. Uh, and I want a budget that actually works for the kind of future I think we need in Pennsylvania. Let's cut out the smoke and mirrors. Let's stop playing the games that allow us to come up and sort of do the sleight of hand that says, hey, things are working just fine, just trust us, when they're really not. And, and let's actually demand that Harrisburg get its act together and, and put its house in order uh, and actually give us a budget that actually makes sense, a budget that actually is balanced, uh, and a budget that actually does what we need it to do in terms of giving the tax relief to the people who need it most, property tax relief. So that's, that's what I want to see in this budget. That's what I'm holding out for, uh, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So thank you for having me, Mayor. Good, good to be back. Good to see you, sir. Thank, thank you very you much. So I'm well. happy to take questions. Governor, on that property tax um, plan, if you ask for Republicans, they will tell you that amounts to effectively about a $4 billion shift. Um, 3.8. 
a billion here, a billion there. Um, <laughs> right. But and that there's no guarantee in the back end that property taxes right. won't crawl back up again. Right. Um, they say you've under discussed that side of it. I mean, that the substantial the substantial PIT increase and the expanded number of items that will be covered covered on the sales tax. Can we address that? Now? Sure. sure. And, and two. What guarantee there is against this property taxes not crawling back up again, even with this proposed cut? Okay. Now, my father said that at my age I should not be taking two part questions because I'll forget the second question. You'll, you'll remind me what the second question is. Actually, what was the first question? No, I, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, first of all, it, it is absolutely right that, that uh, if you drop $3.8 billion in property taxes, those are local taxes and you want to shift that to the state level, you are talking about a corresponding, here's where the math is going to floor you, $3.8 billion tax increase at the state level. That's the way it works. Now, I know disingenuousness is not something you've seen anything of in politics in Pennsylvania before, but it's sort of disingenuous <coughs> when people on the Republican side say he's talking about a $3.8 billion state tax increase to fund this tax decrease. I got to admit that's true, because I want a $3.8 billion tax cut on the on the uh, property tax side. Now, the second question is a really important one, and that is, how do you guarantee that school districts won't do what they did with the casinos, and that is just raise the taxes two, three, four years down the road, or even sooner than that? I think that's a fair question, uh, because in the past, they haven't had a great record of, of avoiding that. Uh, in my proposal, I proposed actually a way of, of doing that, of, 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 sh of keeping that from happening, which is to say that uh, right now, school districts, if their uh, reserves go below, it depends on the school district, 8 to 12 percent of their annual operating budget, they can raise taxes without a back end, without a referendum. I propose reducing that to 4 percent, which would make it harder for school districts to actually raise taxes without a referendum uh, and would uh, almost eliminate it. There were still some that would, st would qualify because their, rev their reserves were below 4 percent, but not very many. Uh, but I also said, and I've said this to your, I think, third question about whether I haven't talked about this enough. I have said right from the beginning, if there's a better way to, to create that guarantee, I'm all ears. I want to do that. And I've been talking with Republicans about how we might do that, um, uh, whether it's a, a, you know, a back-end referendum for any tax increase, uh, whether it's a back-end referendum uh, that if it gives a tax, if you get a tax increase, you have a... Uh, uh, a sunset provision after a number of years. I'm open to anything because this has to be dollar for dollar tax relief. It cannot be uh, just another, you know, one time gimmick that, that comes back to bite you. So I'm open to that. Uh, and if I don't have, if I'm not uh, in, in what I proposed so far and, and the, the conversations we've had, uh, if there's a better way, I'm, I'm open to that kind of thing. This has to be a, a tax. But what I'm really focused on is getting that shift to the state for the funding of public education. I think we're 47th or 46th in the country in terms of the state share of funding for public education. That's just wrong. I guess Mr. Saylor would say that his is a full dollar for dollar. You're talking about a what, 40 to 50 percent reduction in local property taxes? I'm not sure what he means by that. Mine's, I, I, I was proposing dollar for dollar. Now, he, he does have, uh, he, his proposal was a standalone, and, and, and I, thought, I thought it was a really good thing that the, the House actually passed substantive property tax relief, and I think that set up a good conversation as to how we move forward. Uh, and I think what was heartening was people actually are, are supportive of substantive property tax relief. I have some disagreements with Representative Saylor's uh, formula. He obviously has some with mine, so it's, it's a topic of a conversation, and I'm sure we can reach some agreement. Uh, but we have to start with the recognition that we need property tax relief. And then just one more. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. What parts of the budget do you see as non-negotiable, and which parts are you willing to be flexible on? Well, I'm. I. This is something that that I. It just flus. I, I don't understand how uh, I'm getting pegged with this not willingness, unwillingness to 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 conceive things. I'm. I think we we actually. Um, okay. Two plus two equals four. Yeah, I can't compromise on that. Now they actually have been pushing out budgets that have two plus two equals five, and so, you know, we. I guess I could say, what? Let's go halfway. Four and a half. Well, it still equals four, no matter what I say. Gravity exists, you know. And and as much as you'd like to legislate that away, and maybe they think they can, when you fall from ten feet, it hurts. And so there's certain things that you can't compromise, and I think that's one. We've got to come up with a budget that, that actually balances. 
when it comes to all the other things, you know, I, I really want to fund education fully. I mean, adequately. We've got to do that. I don't know what how you, you, you compromise on that. What are we going to compromise on a child's future? We're going to compromise on our future. We're going to compromise on our, our economy. You know, we're going to say that, yeah, even though plumbers and electricians need to know physics these days, we're going to basically... Uh, Compromise on on a good a good school system for everybody. I don't know how you do that, but certain things like like the the severance tax. We don't have a severance tax. We're one of the the only we're the only major gas producing state in the United States without a severance tax on on its natural resources. Texas, Alaska, Louisiana. I mean, these are not radical states, um, but we don't have one. So, you know, I think we ought to have one. But I'm willing to compromise on how we do. It. Just as an example, I've compromised three ways. First thing, my proposal uh, called for a 5% uh, severance tax with a 4.7 cents per thousand cubic feet ad adder with a floor on the assumed price. Someone correctly, I think, pointed out that when you have a floor on that price under certain market conditions, the uh, tax could be excessive. So I said, yeah, that makes sense. So I took the floor out. Second thing was I, I had a $225 million provision. The first $225 million would go to take the place of the impact fee because localities uh, uh, where drilling was taking place needed that to keep up the uh, um, the infrastructure. And someone pointed out that that, and I set it at $225 million because that was the highest point, I think it was like two years ago, that the impact fee provided. So I said, okay, $225 million. And someone said, well, you have it as, as a floor, but it also uh, implicitly works as a cap. And that could really be hurtful if things get to the point where, you know. So I said, okay, take away the cap. And then finally, someone said, you know, the responsibility for collecting this tax is with the revenue department. Uh, they can be bureaucratic. They can be red tape. So I said, let's do self-reporting on what your, what your market price actually is. That's what you pay. You do the self-reporting. So I'm, I'm willing to compromise uh, on a lot of things, we just, I, I can't compromise on Pennsylvania's future. I can't compompromise on two plus two equals four. Yes? Barbara, some of the uh, human service agencies in your county have taken out a line of credit to ensure they can pay their bills uh, after uh, September in light of the current situation. How optimistic are you that, uh, that you guys uh, will bang it out uh, before September 1st? I, I think, you know, this is a, it takes two to tango. They're uh, members of the House and Senate who have to help answer that question. Uh, I presented my budget on time, March 3rd. I am at the Capitol every day. Uh, I'm heading up there right after this meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm working hard to try to get there. I can't, I don't, I, I don't know how to predict when it's, when it's going to happen. I'm doing what I can to, to mitigate whatever inconveniences there are for, for human service organizations. But as I pointed out here, the budget that I was presented with on June 30th, I think, would have been even worse than a late budget for these human service organizations. Uh, so I stood up to it. And I think if, if we have a budget that actually works for Pennsylvania, every organization, every human being in Pennsylvania is going to be in a better place than if I signed that. Anything you want to say to these folks, the human service agencies, uh, who right now are worried about running out? Money. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to do my best. I, I think the the I'm going to do my best to mitigate the inconvenience. <coughs> but in the end, I think we have to decide whether we want to have a, a budget that actually gives us a little bit uh, in the short run, but but actually gives us some convenience in that short run. But in the long run, actually doesn't do what we need it to do. Uh, or do we want a budget that might be some have some inconvenience in the short run, but in the end will get us to a better place? And I think the answer would be, I want to be in a better place in the long run. That's what I'm fighting for. You said you're going up to the Capitol after this to meet. Who are you meeting with uh, today to, uh, to talk about the budget? This afternoon, yeah. Who are you meeting with? The leadership of the House and Senate. How often um, how have you been meeting with them? Well, I've been meeting, um, I, I don't know what the frequency is, but my the staff meets um, uh, fairly frequently in, 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 in conversations about what we need to do to to get the budget to a better place. So so I'm not sure if it's just me personally, uh, the administration, I think we're working most days. Jan, go ahead. I was just wondering, following up on this question about who you're meeting with, is it it's just the Republican leaders tonight? I think the Democrats are going to be there, too. Yeah, I was just wondering, since we're just like five hours away from that meeting, I mean, how do events like this and the one yesterday in Norristown help 
to achieve that compromise that needs to happen for this budget to get done? Yeah, I, that's a good question. There's a there is a tactical feature here in, in negotiating that that includes some theatrics and dramatics, uh, and I guess maybe this helps that. But but I think the the real thing I'm trying to do is say, you know, I. I don't have the votes in the House. I don't have the votes in the Senate. My only hope is to say to the voters, the people, our bosses out there in Pennsylvania, 12.7 million Pennsylvanians, this is what this, the fight is about. Where do you want me to, what do you want me to do? I, I think, as I say, as a, as a new uh, governor, somebody who came to, to office, um, uh, this is my first time run for public office, um, I'm a Pennsylvania. I'm a native Pennsylvania. I still live in a house I was brought home to from the hospital. And I want to do the right thing. And and so uh, I assume that most of the 12.7 million Pennsylvanians, if they had the right information, would, would want to do the right thing too. And so I'm presenting my case to our bosses. And that's what I'm doing with things like this. And I'm, my hope is that, that more and more they'll be calling their representatives in Harrisburg who will be talking to their leaders in Harrisburg and saying, you know, I'm not so sure the same old, same old is going to work anymore. So why won't you have done this a, a little bit earlier in the game? I was doing it, Jan. I started this the day I was inaugurated. I went out selling uh, what I was doing, and after I presented my budget, I, I, was, I continued to do focus on the budget. Before the budget, obviously, I was just talking more general things, but I've been on a campaign mode, basically talking to the people of Pennsylvania. I've been to, I think, 40 or 50 school districts uh, around the state. So I, I have been doing this for a while. And you're, you're clear, I'm sorry. But just just um, you calling it a campaign, I mean, that is one thing that this budget crusade really has become a campaign on, on both sides now. And aren't you, are you at all concerned that that's just going to alienate people and make people say, everyone in Harrisburg doesn't know what they're doing? Yeah. It could. It, that's a. It, uh, anything's possible. It could be that they people end up saying, eh, I think the 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 same old same old works." They could end up saying, "I think this new guy, uh, you know, he, he's new, and he's, uh, but uh, maybe he has an, uh, an idea that works." Or it could be a pox on both your houses. I, I think the, the the goal in a, in a healthy democracy is to make sure the options are out there. And and in the end, uh, if the people I'm supposedly speaking for, say, you know, you're actually not speaking for me, then that's the way democracy is supposed to work. Sure. So that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. To what extent does this independent expenditure money complicated matters, either from the DGA or your PAC or from Americans for Posterity, Prosperity or the PA Chamber, um, elevated tensions beyond what they might have been ordinarily? I, I, I don't think they, I think that's, again, in democracy, it's part of the, the, the package of people out there exercising their free speech to, to tell people what they... Uh, this may be the first time a sitting governor that has used his own political action committee to lobby for his policy goals. Uh, I, my own political action committee has lobbied. I think the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce is not part of my political action committee, neither is the... Of course, they're not on my side. Uh, well, Wolf, Wolf, Wolf Pack has emailed to supporters asking... Oh, okay. Okay. To, to, uh, to pass a budget. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not familiar, I'm not aware that that's, that's the first time that, that that's happened. But, but I, again, I am looking for ways, including right here, talking directly to the, the people of Pennsylvania and saying, you know, this is what I think. You have to decide. Your representatives, of which I am one, we have to decide, and we need your input. That's, that's a pure thing. So I think, yeah, there are different ways of getting out. This is one. That's another. They're using that. I'm using that. They're st speaking directly to the, to the press through uh, to, to you and speaking to the people through you. Um, uh, I'm doing things <coughs> like this. I'm making speeches. Uh, I think that's what you do in a democracy, uh, and, and I think we, we ought to make sure that, that, that is, that's how democracy is supposed to function. As far as I can see. We have time for one more. Man down. Yes. Uh, let's see. You talked a lot about credit downgrades when, uh, when you were talking there, and you mentioned irresponsible budgeting as being a major factor. Do you think, how much of a factor do you think, uh, I guess, pension obligations is, is it setting back credit downgrades? Uh, if you look at the credit downgradings, uh, they mention pensions. That That is a part of it, and I think it is a key part. And I think, as, as I said throughout my campaign, and I still think, Pension reform is important. I had a proposal in, in my budget. It was different from the, the one that, that came out of the Senate and the House on June 30th. 
but I think uh, we both start from a point that we agree that pension reform is not, we cannot kick this can down the road. I've said that. I said that before I was elected. I said it. I've said it since I've been elected, and I continue to say that. But that is not, let's be clear, that is not the sum total of the credit downgrade. And I, that's why I pointed out these other things that have nothing to do with the pension, that, that we have smoke and mirrors in this budget, uh, and that's, um, that's what's leading to the things like those credit downgrades. What do you hope Kathleen Payne says today? Uh, I hope she says she's going to. I hope she says she's going to resign. Thank you. Thank you very much.